Hello and welcome back to the Essentials of Computer Architecture, Computer Architecture and Organization. We're going to continue our process of working through part two, which is the first major section that we're talking about in this class. And uh, what we're going to focus on is getting a little bit more in depth into what takes place in CPUs, and that's chapter eight. And so we will be talking about microcode. Hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll get a better understanding of what that might mean. Protection, that there can be distinctions of how you would allow function in an operating system versus in an application. And what are some of the processor modes that can take place? So it's a, a next level of detail that is useful to know and hopefully um, you'll begin to see some of the advantage and some of the historical perspectives of how this has developed over time. So let's talk about the evolution of computers, um, talk about the very early systems that ex existed and the, the modern computer, how that is um, built upon that. At the very beginning, there was a single central processing unit. Um, there was a single core that controlled the entire computer. It was responsible for all I.O. as well as all computation. In modern computers, this is no longer the case. There's a, a much more of a decentralized architecture. The, the CPU chip can contain multiple cores, and you can have anywhere from dual core, quad core, for up to 64 core. Um, CPUs, and I'm sure that's just going to, to get larger. You might remember we talked about Moore's Law earlier. And unfortunately, we're getting to a point where um, getting smaller and smaller chips um, to put in more and more transistors into something like a CPU is no longer um, working. You, we can't, we're kind of getting to close to the atomic level. And so cores is another way that we can start to increase performance. Each I.O. device, whether it be a disk or something else, contains a processor. It could be a full-fledged processor. It could be something called a microcontroller, where, which we have mentioned previously a little bit. And CPU, um, the CPU performs computation and coordination um, of other processors. So it's like the conductor of smaller conductors. So you can think of the, the CPU as a general, then it has sergeants that are doing more localized um, um, direction overall processes. So talking about CPU complexity, uh, the CPU design for is um, most the most general type of CPU is going to be designed for a wide variety of control and processing tasks. Uh, the most complex CPUs have many special purpose hardware sub hardware units. And so inside the device, they have more focused hardware subunits that can be turned on, can, they can be utilized, but not, not necessarily all the time. Um, we will be talking about Arduino um, kits later, and that'll be one of our projects. And you'll see an example of special purpose hardware subunits that are in that, which is a simpler form of a um, computational um, controller. And so an example, Intel makes a, a multi-core chip that contains over 2.5 billion transistors. And early on in our lectures, we saw that say on the order of four transistors is what it would take to make a logic gate, four or more. So that gives you a rough idea of how many gates could exist in a, um, a chip. So let's talk about CPU characteristics. Um, a CPU is in the, the most general form. It's meant to be completely general. It, 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 can, conform, it can perform um, control functions as well as basic computations. Well, it's designed for lots of flexibility. It offers multiple levels of protection and privilege. And we'll be talking uh, shortly about a, um, a barrier per se between the operating system and the applications. And that's something that the, the CPU can offer. It, 
It can provide some mechanisms for hardware priorities. Um, say you have a interrupt of some sort and you, if you get an interrupt of a high enough priority, that's going to stop whatever program it's running and, and do something else. Um, so that's an example of a hardware priority that, that can start to be seen. It handles large volumes of data and it uses parallels, parallelism to achieve um, higher speed. And we'll walk through a little bit of an example what that would look like. Plus, there are various modes of execution. A, a CPU hardware has several possible modes. At any time, a, a C, CPU operates in one mode. So you have to um, tell it to operate in a certain mode, and then it can switch. And there's a couple of different ways that that can take place. Um, the modes dictate the instructions that are valid. It, it um, dictates what regions of memory that can be accessed. And in the next major section, when we talk about memory, we'll talk about um, virtual memory and talk about regions of memory and how to be having uh, multiple chips that contain memory. And, and yet the way that the CPU sees it, it sees it as one continu contiguous set of memory. So that's some, some things that start to get in when you talk about regions of memory. Um, it can determine the amount of privilege that's, that's dictated for a certain type of operation. It can also be configured to handle backward comp compatibility with earlier models. Um, say you have a subroutine or some type of code that was des um, written for something earlier some earlier model, it's been validated and you don't want to have to start over and go through a, a, an extensive revalidation process. There can be times when backward compatibility is, is a useful feature. And the CPU behavior can vary widely among the modes. Um, and so having a very flexible CPU has its advantages. It's like a Swiss army knife with all kinds of functions and you can choose what you need at any particular time. So how should we be thinking about these modes? Um, imagine multiple hardware units inside the, the CPU. In some cases it may actually be hardware or the way that we see it at a higher level abstraction it's basically could be equivalent to that but the actual impl implementation might be different. Um, the modes which um, mode selects um, that whatever mode that you're in, it selects which hardware is used at a given time. And so if we were to contrast between two different modes, um, things that um, potentially could be different would be the word sizes, the number of registers, the instruction sets. So these could be switched to be larger, to be smaller, to having a larger number of registers. Say if you're doing floating point arithmetic, um, or other calculations, you might need more registers. If you want to go to double precision, then you might want to have your word size be double. If you want to go into an extended instruction set, um, you, you may have to modify that. So those are examples of maybe giving you a little bit more context. So how can we change the, the mode we're operating in? And there's two possibilities. There, there's an automatic, approach and there's a manual approach. An automatic approach would be it's initiated by hardware. Um, when a, a cer certain device needs service, um, the, the hardware switches to support that. Um, prior to change, the, the software that's the operating system must specify which code to run and when to, to the change is supposed to occur. Another option would be uh, manual and an application makes an explicit request to change modes. And typically this occurs when the application calls an operating system function. So there's a, an application makes a system call and that system call causes a, a manual change in the way that the, um, the CPU operates. Um, so there, there's a couple ways how that may occur. Um, one thing that's related is maybe you've heard direct memory access. Some um, 
applications are trying to get as much speed as possible and they're trying to get permission and coordination with the operating system to make things quicker. And so say if you have a GUI application that um, has high um, um, utilization of your monitor, there, there might be a need for that. But that's just an example of maybe you've heard of. So let's talk about privilege levels now as we're starting to go over privilege and protection. And the privilege level determines which resources a program can use. It's usually coupled to the, the mode that is being utilized and the, the basic scheme falls into two levels, a, a user mode for applications, which um, has a, a variety of um, privileges to write, read and write, and to execute to certain parts of the computational resources, but, but not all of them. And then there's the kernel mode for the operating system, which has um, special administrative privileges that goes beyond what a regular user program would have. And it's nice to have this, this barrier because um, say if the application run into problem, you still have control of your system. You can abort that application and still have your operating system still functioning. And there are advanced schemes to how you, you can have multiple levels. And so there may be hybrids that, that also could exist. And in, in almost any architecture, the operating system can execute additional instructions that an application cannot. So here is an illustration of the two level privilege scheme. And we were talking about the application. So these have low pro, um, privilege. And then the operating system has high privileges. And we mentioned there may even be special instructions that they can um, call upon that would not be available to applications. Applications run with low privilege and the operating system runs with high privilege, just as a reminder. So now let's talk about microcode. Um, sometimes the way that a processor is designed, there's a lower level functionality that even when you're um, programming at the assembly lang language level, you may not have um, the, the visibility into that, but it, it, it does exist. And so we're going to expose that a little bit here. And we're gonna be talking more about um, what, what a microcontroller um, would be doing. And so micro, micro code and a microcontroller, they, they work hand in hand. So this is a hardware technique used in RIS, in CISC processor, that's complex, complex instruction set um, computer, um, and it employs two levels of processor hardware, the, the microprocessor, um, which in this context, um, we can be referring to a microcontroller, it provides the, the, the basic instructions. And so there's a micro and a macro, and then the macro instructions set, um, build on the, the, the micro instructions. So that's at a higher level abstraction than the, the micro um, code instructions. The, the macro instructions and, and micro instructions may differ completely. And so a concept, key concept here is it's easier to construct a complex processors by writing programs than by building hardware from scratch. And so if you have flexible hardware you can have higher level complexity if the, the underlying um, processor design it has enough complexity to handle that. And so here is an illustration that will hopefully provide some additional insight. And on the left here, we can see that this, this whole box is the, the CPU, the central processing unit, but it's, it's divided into two parts, the lower level, um, maybe you can think of a brain analogy, some of the more base functionality of the brain, um, the medulla oblongata or, or something like that. And so these are things that you have hardware that is implemented using, using digital logic. And there's a, a micro instruction set that the processor uses that isn't 
necessarily um, visible to the programmer. Um, and then we have this, this other level that is um, a visible to the programmer, the, the macro instruction set. And so we'll get a chance to start to consider those distinctions. Um, in terms of the, the sizes, the, the integer and register sizes, um, size, size used by a micro instruction set, instruction set can differ from size um, the size used by a macro instruction. For example, a micro instru instruction set may only offer 16-bit ar ar arithmetic, while a macro instruction set would provide 32-bit um, arithmetic. And so if we're going to be doing some processing at the micro level, we're going to have to figure out, and yet we ultimately want to be doing a 32-bit operation, that's something that we're going to have to consider. And the next couple of charts will walk through what that would look like. So let's consider microcode arithmetic. So the assumption for this example, at the, the macro level, we have registers. They're 32 bits wide, and we call those with a capital R, so R0, R1. Remember that the, the convention is we, you usually start registers with a zero. Um, and then the micro registers are each 16 bit wide and they're, they're, they're named with a small um, R, so little r0, little r1, et cetera. So let's devise a microcode um, example to add values from r5 and r6. And that's laid out here in this example when I tried to um, annotate the very beginning in the pseudocode. Uh, the basic instruction in red to hopefully make it a little bit clearer. So we want to be doing a 32-bit add, and so we're going to be compute um, add 32 R5 plus R6. And so we have to move the, the low order 16 bits from R5 into R2 because um, at this 16-bit um, level, all we have available are um, 16 bit wide registers and operations. So we put one in, um, we, we put things into R2 and R3, so the lower bits of R5 and R6. We add those together and place them in R1. Uh, we save them. Then we do the, the higher order for both R5 and R6. Put those in R2 and R3, add them together and place them in R0. Copy the value of um, value in R2, R0 to R2. Then we add R2 and then carry in, and the carry bit place into the result of R1. We, we check the overflow and set the conditional code. And we, then we move the 32 bit results from R0 and R1 to the desired destination. So a single add at the um, 32-bit level, we have to break it up into multiple operations, but that, that gives you an example of what um, could be going on underneath the hood in a, a microcode example. So what about microcode variation? There can be um, a couple different modes. You can have a restricted or full scope. Um, so special purpose instructions only. Um, so here that would be thinking about complex instructions or ex extensions to normal instruction sets. So that would be um, one mode operating um, special purpose instructions only, or you have all instructions. So that would be one way that you could switch between those, or you can have um, partial or complete use. You could be using the entire fetch cycle, fetch execute cycle. You can have just focusing on the instruction FET and FET, fetch and decode. You could be um, focusing on opcode processing or operand decode and fetch. And so um, a particular set of microcode instructions may be just focusing on one of those things. And so you need to make sure it's configured to, to do that. So why do we want to be using microcode instead of circuits? It's a higher level of abstraction. There's more flexibility. It's easier to build and less error prone than building with logic gates. 
and it's easier to change um, just by a few clicks, a few um, uh, clock cycles, you can go from one mode to another. You can easily upgrade to the next version of a chip. You can avoid field upgrades. So those are also some things that are out there um, to show the benefit. What are some of the disadvantages of microcode? There's, there's more overhead. Macro inst instruction performance depends on the micro instruction set. And uh, the microprocessor hardware must be run at extremely high clock rates to accommodate multiple micro instructions per macro instructions. So it's just a whole, it's another level of um, complexity below a top level macro complexity. And so that would be what's going on. So what about the, the visibility to programmers? Um, how much are you going to let the programmer to, to see? Um, so one mode would be a fixed, or you might think of it in terms of an immutable um, microcode. This um, approach is used by most CPUs. Uh, the microcode is only visible to the CPU designer. It's really not necessary for um, an assembly language programmer or above to, to be um, getting it, needing to, to see all that. Um, another one is an uh, alterable microcode that the, the microcode is loaded dynamically, may be restricted to extensions, that is creating new microcode instructions. Um, user software written, it's possible that user software could be written to use new instructions. And so this is, uh, would be known as a reconfigurable CPU. At least parts of it could be reconfigurable. And so an interesting question to think about, if you could change microcode, what would you change? Um, so what happens in practice? Writing microcode is tedious and time-consuming compared to application programming. The results are difficult to test. And the performance of a microcode can be much worse than performance of dedicated hardware. The result is that reconfigurable CPUs have not enjoyed much success. Um, more recent technology for reprogrammable processors is what's called FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. And those have all kinds of flexibility for special purpose operations. Well, let's talk about two fundamental types of microcode. What programming paradigm is used for a microcode? We can have either a vertical type or we can have a horizontal type, and we'll talk about those um, one at a time. First, um, let's look at vertical microcode. Ver vertical microcode is similar to conventional assembly language. <clears throat> the microprocessor um, uses fetch execute and executes one instruction at a time. So it's a little tiny fetch ex execute machine underneath the, the hood <clears throat> that is uh, continuing to do a variety of different things. The micro instructions can access um, an arithmetic logic unit, an ALU, <clears throat> the macro general purpose registers, memory, and IO buses. So it's acting like a little tiny CPU underneath the hood. <clears throat> so what are examples of um, vertical microcode? Um, macro code instructions um, set is um, in, in a CISC processor. So um, that can be an example where vertical microcode can be used. Um, you can be thinking of a, a microprocessor that um, is a fast risk processor. They can be taking advantage of that. And um, pro a programmer can write microcode for each macro instruction. The, the hardware decodes macro instructions and, and invokes um, correct micro, the correct microcode routine. So what are the disadvantages and, dis and um, advantages and disadvantages of vertical microcode? It's, it's easy to read. Programmers are comfortable using it. It's, yet it's unattractive to hardware designers because um, higher clock rates are, are needed. 
And generally, it has lower performance. Um, that is, many micro instructions are needed for each macro instruction. So that's a little bit about vertical. How about horizontal? So it's an alternative to ver vertical microcode, and it ex exploits parallelism in underlying hardware. So this gets into the multi-core paradigms and control. So in this mode, it, it controls function, functional units and data movement. It is extremely difficult to, to program. Um, you have to figure out how you're going to be parallelizing things. And so the paradigm is each micro instruction controls a set of hardware units. An instruction specifies which hardware units to operate and how data is transferred among them. So let's consider an example for horizontal microcode. Consider the internal structure of a CPU. Data can only move along a specific path between functional units. And so here we have, um, we have the arithmetic logic unit. You have the two operands that you're processing on. You have uh, the results. Um, and then we have the, the macro general purpose um, registers. And so we have this um, little um, mic horizontal microcode um, encapsulation that engages um, with the, the macro generated purpose registers um, after it, it's, it's done its operation. So um, let's start to specify in more details um, what can take place within this, this micro code um, by specifying different fields in the, um, in the bits. And so first here is a, a mapping of within the arithmetic logic control, what each which of um, three bits, which on um, each type of um, way that, that they could come up, what kind of operation we would do, whether it's add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, no operation or no op, um, shifting left or right, or whether it's going to take more than one clock cycle and so it's continue with the previous. You have um, uh, an operand and so you either can have no operation or load value from a data transfer mechanism. And so um, this is what the, the operands would have. And then you can have the results. And once again, either there's no operation or you're going to be sending. So you have operands that you load, you have results that you send. We have um, things that you configure with the ALU. Then you have the register interface um, where the, the first two digits are, are used to give some distinction about what you're going to be doing, either no operation, you move register, and then you have um, a designation. Um, so you move register to data transfer. You have data transfer mechanism to register. So it's a, a load or send um, function with your, your register interface. So that um, gives you sort of the, the lookup table for what these values are. And here's what it looks like in terms of a picture. Um, and we'll be using this for an example. So the diagram shows how the groups of bits in the, in the instruction are um, interpreted in each set of bit controls, one hardware unit. So um, a couple chapters ago, we looked at the construct for a fixed length instruction. This looks very similar, um, but there's not as many bits. So um, that's one of the things that you'll notice about this. And um, so what are we going to do in our um, horizontal microcode step example? So we want to move the value from register 4 to the hardware unit for operand 1, move the value from register um, 13 to the hardware unit no, uh, operand 2, arrange for the operand to perform an addition, move the value from the hardware unit for result two, the lower orbits, order bits of the results to register four. And so you can just flip back to this chart and you'll get a reminder of what some of these fields represent. Um, but let's start to look at the in binary, what some of these functions are. 
And remember, here we have the, the four operations that we're performing, and here it is um, what it looks like. And so you have the control function, you have the operands, you have the results, and you have the reg register interface. And here is what it looks like for each one of these four commands. And so in four um, lines of code here, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13 bits, um, we do these four microcode instructions. And so that gives you an idea what it looks like. And we can observe that this does not resemble a conventional program. It's um, a very low level set of um, operations. So um, the looking and considering the, the mic horizontal microcode and timing, each microcode instruction takes only one micro cycle. And the, the given functional unit may require more than one cycle to complete an operation. And the programmers must accommodate hardware timing or errors can result. So you wanna make sure that you finish a microcode instruction before you move on to the next one. To wait for a functional unit, the, the, you can insert the microcode instruction that continues the operation. And so this would be similar to the no-op, a no-operation instruction, which we talked about earlier. So um, the ALU operation 111 acts as a delay to continue the previous operation. None of the other hardware units are active, so it doesn't matter what you put in here. And just as a reminder, um, this is what it stands for. 111 can stands for a continue the, the previous operation. And so that's what we're seeing. So in terms of a parallel execution, this is what is laid out here. And um, a single microcode instruction can continue the ALU operation and also load the value from register seven into operand unit one. By using horizontal microcode, a programmer can specify simultaneous parallel operations of multiple hardware units. So this is giving you some insight of how you would do parallelization, um, leveraging multiple core in a processor and at the microcode level. So th let's think a little bit about an intelligent microprocessor. So uh, this, in this case, it would have the ability to schedule instructions by assigning work to fundamental units. Um, it handles operations in parallel. It performs branch op optimization by beginning to execute both paths of a branch. Um, the, there's, cons it, there's constraint, the constraints results. So um, instructions have sequential semantics. Um, it, it keeps the results separate, decides which path to use when branch um, direction fi is finally known. So it has enough smarts to know if you break things up into parts that it knows how to put things back together um, in the end. And so there needs to be some methodology for, quote, taming the parallel execution units. Um, parallel hardware can compute various uh, values out of order and um, follow two possible branches. Um, the CPU must preserve sequential macro instruction semantics as expected by the, the programmer. And so a couple mechanisms are used is a scoreboard or a reorder buffer. Um, when the result, results um, computed from two paths, so the CPU eventually discards the results that are not needed. So it, it can have these parallelism and it may not know exactly which one is the correct one until it uses one of these um, mechanisms. Which one scores better? Or does it have a, a reorder buffer to figure out that you know, it took the wrong branch? It can also have the ability to do branch predictions, um, knowing that what's the best bet, if you will, and most of the time you could be getting it right. And so it's a, an alternative to parallel execution. It handles uh, conditional execution. Hardware, um, the hardware assumes a branch will be taken 
and unrolls computation and if it is not. So it takes, goes in the direction would it, it probabilistically know will be the, the most likely path. And if it's wrong, it just goes back and it has this um, reorder buffer that it can um, resort to to um, fix what ends up being the, the wrong choice. Studies have shown that the branch is taken approximately 60% of the time. So it's not a 50-50 proposition. So um, there is some merit to, to be considering that as a, an alternative. So let's just summarize with a couple slides here as we got into more complexity about CPU architecture and operation. A CPU can offer modes of execution that determine protection and privilege. We talked about the distinction between applications and operating systems. That's uh, probably the, the biggest example of that. Um, a complex CPU, CPU usually is implement, implemented using microcode, and we talked about CISC operators, um, central processing units using that more. We talked about vertical microcode, and it uses a conventional instruction set that is similar to what you would see at the macro level. Horizontal microcode uses unconventional instructions, and it's a way of, um, to parallelize things in, in multiple cores. Each horizontal microcode instruction controls the underlying hardware units, and the horizontal microcode offers parallelism, which is a, a nice feature. So just to, to continue and to finish, most complex CPUs have mechanism to schedule instructions on parallel execution units. And there's ways of how to figure out um, and reassemble the things that are done in parallel execution. You can have either a scoreboard method or a reorder buffer to maintain the, the um, sequential semantics that you figure out which one scores better, that's the one you keep. You make an assumption of which direction to go, and if you're wrong, then you back out and then, then you do it again. Okay, with that, we'll finish up for this lecture. And thank you very much.